So, one of our favorite expressions when it comes to Christmas season is peace on earth. After all, that's what the angels said to the shepherds when they made their birth announcement. And one of Isaiah's prophecy about the coming Messiah said that he would be called the Prince of Peace. We sing about it in our Christmas carols. We talk about the little town of Bethlehem lying still in the night. We sing Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm, all is bright. We talk about the bells echoing out, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And yet for many people, Christmas is anything but peaceful. I was watching a news report on Wednesday evening about how the local Walmarts were getting ready for the big Black Friday event, and they cut to a local uh, Walmart employee, and the first thing she said was, she said, our first priority is to ensure the safety of our customers and employees. Now, what does that say about us as a society? That when we start talking about going shopping, the first thing we need to talk about is safety. I mean, that's the sort of thing you say if you own a coal mine, right? We, we want to ensure the safety of our employees. It's the sort of thing you say if there's a hurricane coming. You know, we want to just make sure all of our citizens are safe. It's not the sort of thing you usually say when you own a retail store. And yet, we got our usual round of footage and stories about crowds rushing into stores, tussling over gifts. It's hardly the picture of peace. More than that, I came across a 2012 NBC News story where 45% of those surveyed said they would just as soon skip the holiday season altogether. And the angle of that story is that the financial pressures of Christmas are just so much people would rather they could skip it entirely. An older survey from England, 2003, said that Christmas is now considered the sixth most stressful life event, right up there with things like divorce, moving, or changing jobs. The story attached to that survey cited the pressure of finding just the right gift, included anecdotes about a woman who bought her non-pregnant sister a maternity dress, and a man who bought a very expensive mirror for his girlfriend, which broke while he was wrapping it. And of course, the stress associated with the holidays goes beyond just the pressures of giving gifts. For some, this time of year elevates feelings of loneliness and depression. Family tensions can sometimes be amplified by the messages of the season. The dream of a Norman Rockwell, like picture-perfect um, family card kind of gathering is, is, is rarely achieved. Hollywood has a whole genre of movies based on dysfunctional holiday gatherings. So ideas of Christmas peace rarely come to fruition. And it's not just a problem for the holiday season. Many of us move through life with a large amount of anxiety and fear. Life rarely goes as planned. There's a great deal of tension and chaos from day to day within our lives. So forget the wars and rumors of war that continue to make worldwide headlines. Many of us would just like to experience a little personal peace. So when I think about stress and anxiety in the biblical story of Christmas... The character that springs to mind is Joseph. If you asked Joseph about his Christmas experience, I'm sure the last thing he would do would be to quote the lyrics from Silent Night. For Joseph, it was anything but all is calm and all is bright. Most of what we know about Joseph is told in Matthew chapter 1, specifically verses 18 through 25, but I'm going to back up just a couple of verses earlier and start in Matthew 1, verses 16 and 17. It says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And there are 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, 14 from the exile to the Christ. The Gospel of Matthew begins with Christ's genealogy. For Matthew, it's important for us to understand that Jesus is born into the line of King David. But there's something interesting about the way Joseph is listed in this genealogy. Everyone else on Jesus' family tree is listed as the father of. 
So David is the father of Solomon. Solomon is the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the father of Abijah, and so on. But Joseph is not listed as the father of. Rather, Joseph is listed as the husband of. It's the husband of Mary, of whom is born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So while Joseph's place in the line of David is important, and so is Mary, she's also born into David's line, we're told right off the bat that Jesus is not Joseph's biological son. There's something unique about the circumstances of Jesus' birth. So here then is Joseph's story, starting at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Here is the beginning of Joseph's stress. He's pledged to be married to Mary. We would say that they were engaged, though in that culture, uh, this pledging process would have been much stronger, would have had much more legal ramification than an engagement in our world. Some of you will remember this summer when we went through the book of Revelation, I talked about uh, what a wedding, what the wedding process looked like in that culture. And it, it began when a young man would go to meet with a young woman's father, and they would enter into a sort of contract. They would agree to um, the arrangements for the marriage, then the young lady would be brought in and asked if she was willing to marry this man. And then from that moment on, they were uh, betrothed to each other. For all intents and purposes, legally speaking, they were married except they didn't live together physically yet. Then the young man would go home. He'd go back to his father's house. He'd prepare a room for his bride, and then he'd come back to take her to be with him where he was, and that's when the wedding would take place. That's where Mary and Joseph are at in their relationship. They are legally betrothed. They are committed. They are under contract to one another. They just haven't come together to live together as husband and wife yet. And then Mary announces that she's pregnant by virtue of the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't give a lot of detail as to how those conversations played out, but we can imagine. Mary's story seems preposterous. Most of the village, including Mary's parents, must have assumed that, Jesus, that Joseph was responsible. Joseph and Mary know the truth. They know that they're not having a baby together. They're the only two who know that for certainty. But even Joseph must have assumed there was another man, that Mary either had another lover or that some, someone had violated her in some way. Either way, for Joseph to stay with Mary now that she's telling this story about the Holy Spirit is going to make him look like a liar, a fool, or an idiot. And yet we can see from these verses that Joseph cares about Mary. He shouldn't take that for granted. It's popular in our portrayals of the Christmas story to create a romantic element between Mary and Joseph, to insert some of our modern ideas of romance and love onto their relationship. But remember, in that culture, marriage was much more of a business arrangement than it was anything to do with romance. And yet the Bible says Joseph did not want to expose her to public disgrace. Obviously, he cares about her. As the aggrieved husband, he could have broken off the marital contract publicly, vindictively. He could have demanded some sort of satisfaction for the wrong that he had suffered, but he doesn't do that. Clearly, he has some affection for Mary, yet he wants to make this whole thing go away quietly. So you can add this to his stress, the feeling of betrayal by someone he loved. And then he goes to sleep. And his world is rocked in a whole new way. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Joseph is encountered by an angel who confirms everything Mary has been trying to tell him. There's no other man. What's been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. The angel even gives Joseph the child's intended name. It's the same name that the angel gave to Mary in Luke chapter 1. Now, I have no idea whether Mary 
included that part of her story when she first told Joseph she was expecting. Um, but in our Bible study, the video that accompanies our Bible study, they, they, they portray it as though Mary had not said that name to Joseph. And so when Joseph says the name Jesus, it confirms for both of them that neither one of them is crazy because the angel has independently given them both this same name. And that's how they know now, even though no one else believes them, they know that they're both telling the truth. And the angel says more. Verses 22 and 23. The angel says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is one of the stranger prophecies of Isaiah. It suddenly takes on new meaning. Before this, it had always been assumed that a young girl would give birth in the king's household to a boy symbolically named Emmanuel to remind the people on the verge of exile that God had not abandoned them. In Isaiah's day, something like that probably happened. A young maiden probably got married, had a child in the natural way, gave him the name Emmanuel. But now the angel gives fuller meaning to that prophecy. Mary is truly still a virgin, and she's about, to give, she's about to give birth to God in human flesh. Literally now, God with us. And Joseph, to his credit, believes the angel and obeys. Verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to his son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph did what the Lord had commanded him to do. He stuck with Mary through the cynical looks and the wagging tongues. He stuck with her in spite of his own private doubts and his sleepless nights. He stuck with her even though his stress was really only beginning. Still ahead of him is the 90-mile journey by donkey back with a very pregnant wife to Bethlehem, the the frantic search for an inn, um, the, 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 the conversion of the stable into a delivery room, and then, and then the midnight escape to Egypt in order to escape the rage of a deadly king. Joseph knew stress. He knew anxiety and fear. You would hardly describe his Christmas experience as one of peace. So the verse that really stands out to me in Joseph's story is verse 20. The verse where the angel tells him, do not be afraid. Now I mentioned last week that nearly every time an angel shows up in Scripture, he says, do not be afraid. In fact, I mention it pretty much every time we encounter an angel in one of the stories of the Bible. Um, My point is that if you were suddenly encountered by an angelic being, you would be afraid. Angels in the Bible are not cute little babies with soft golden hair. Angels are supernatural beings that defy physical description. But there's something different about the angel's command to not fear here. It's not the angel that Joseph is scared of. Rather, it's the idea of taking Mary home as his wife. The thing Joseph fears is the thing that's causing his stress. Now, the reason Joseph did not need to be afraid was for decidedly unique circumstances. There really was an otherworldly explanation for what was happening to Joseph. It's not like God is going to come to us and explain that all of the stress in our lives is the result of God bringing a you know, supernatural birth into our world. And yet the Bible tells each of us to not be afraid as well. Whatever anxiety you are feeling, God invites you to bring it to him. In fact, it's often said that the command, be not afraid, is the most often repeated command in Scripture. More than the command to love God or love your neighbor, more than the command to tell the truth or be generous, is the command to not be afraid. Lloyd Ogilvie has even famously said that there are 366 commands to fear not in Scripture, one for every day of the year plus leap year. Now, if you did a search for the phrase, be not afraid or fear not, you wouldn't necessarily come up with 366 verses. But if you include all of the commands to fear God, as well as the verses about not worrying or casting your cares on God, you'd actually come up with more than 366. My point is that God cares about your stress and your anxiety. 
And so whether it's the holidays or something else that has you stressed out, the Bible does have some advice for finding peace. And I have five bits of biblical advice for dealing with your stress. So first, let him carry the load. When stress and anxiety hit, give it to Jesus. God wants to carry your burdens and your fears. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Often we trust God in the general sense. You know, he died for my sins. He promises me heaven when I die. He promises that in the end all the things are going to work for good in my life. I can, I, big picture, I can trust God. But when it comes to specific concerns, specific fears, day-to-day trials, sometimes we think God is not all that concerned. He's too busy. But this verse is referring to your specific anxieties. God is a small picture God as well as a big picture God. He's inviting us to cast our cares, our day-to-day cares and concerns on him as well. So whatever our stress, our anxiety... This verse means for us to bring it to God and trust that he will work in that specific situation. That doesn't mean he will always resolve that fear the way we want. It doesn't mean you'll always find your car keys and the turkey will always come out right. But God does promise to carry our anxiety for us. So what does that look like, practically speaking, to cast our cares on God? Well, It may create a helpful word picture for you to know that the word for cast in this verse is also used in Luke 19.35, which is the story of Palm Sunday. That verse says, When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. And the word for threw there in Luke is the same as the word for cast in 1 Peter chapter 5. So in the same way that you might throw your cloak over the back of a donkey, the same way you might take a burden and throw it on the back of a a donkey, God is inviting you to take your anxieties and throw it on him. He is a God who promises to carry your fears. One of the stunning things about the God of the Bible is that he's a God who promises to work for us before we're ever commanded to work for him. Let me share just a few promises of Scripture with you. Isaiah 46, verse 4 says, Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I've made you. I will carry you. I will sustain you. I will rescue you. Isaiah 64, 4 says, Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. And then this familiar invitation from Jesus, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. God will carry you. God acts on our behalf. God wants our burdens. Pastor John Piper writes, God wants to be a burden bearer because it demonstrates his power and puts him in a class by himself among the so-called gods of the universe. No one has seen a God besides thee who works for those who wait for him. So throw the garments of your anxiety onto him. He wants to carry it. So first, we let him carry the load. Second, you need to trust that God cares for you. When stress and anxiety hit, trust that God wants the best for you. This is the second half of 1 Peter 5, verse 7. That verse again, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This gets to your fundamental understanding of God. When it gets right down to it, do you believe that God is for you or against you? Do you believe that God is on your side, well disposed towards you, or do you believe that God is out to get you? This reminds me of a quote I used earlier this year. I can't remember who said it right now. I don't remember what sermon I preached it in, so I I couldn't find it, but it went something like this. The worst insult you can commit against God is to doubt his love for you. The worst insult you can commit against God is to doubt his love for you. He cares for you. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. 
That's what Christmas is all about. It's because of his deep and passionate love for you that he sent his son into the world. And if he would not withhold from us the son that he loves, then how could we imagine that he would hold back any good thing from us? God cares for you. That's why you can cast your anxieties upon him. He wants to carry that load. He cares for you. That means he cares about the thing that is stressing you out. So trust him. This is a matter of practical trust. And third, let your request be known to God. When stress and anxiety come your way, pray. This is how we transfer the burden. This is how we trust that God cares for us, by praying. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. One of the greatest reasons we feel anxiety and fear is simply that we do not pray enough. We're prayerless. We end up carrying that burden alone. Prayer is the way we express our trust in God. Prayer is trust spoken out loud. So rather than worry, pray. The next verse after this one in Philippians reads like this. It says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you transfer your anxiety and fear to God by prayer, the Bible promises peace. Peace of heart, peace of mind, peace in Christ Jesus. So pray. Then fourth, seek first His kingdom. When stress and anxiety come your way, remember to put God's things first. Matthew 6 is the chapter of the Bible where Jesus talks about worry. He compares us to the flowers of the field, the birds of the air. He reminds us that if, if God dresses the flowers in so much splendor, if he feeds the birds of the air you know, that are dime a dozen, if he, if, he, if he cares so much about them, then how much more will he care about us who are made in his own image? Jesus says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And then near the end of that section of Scripture, Jesus says this, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Sometimes we have a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety because we can't take our eyes off ourselves and our problems. I believe it's sometimes called navel-gazing. Some of us, you know, have our eyes so firmly fixed on our own belly buttons that we don't see anything that's going on around us. And the way to get past all of that personal worry is to start looking beyond ourselves towards Jesus and towards the people he loves. When you give yourself to Jesus, you give yourself to his cause in the world, then rather fretting about this and that and these circumstances in your life, God promises that you'll have everything you need in order to do his will and give him glory. So seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and then everything else you need will be given to you as well. And then fifth and finally, as you deal with anxiety in your life, know that God is with you. When stress and anxiety hit, remember the name the angel gave Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Here's a tremendous promise, Isaiah 41.10. Here's a verse I want you to take home with you today. It says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There are two commands given in this verse, five reasons given that we should keep those commands. The commands are do not fear and do not be dismayed. The reasons were given to keep those commands, for I am with you, for I am your God, for I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When God commands us to do something, he also gives us the ability and the reasons to do it. Power comes from understanding and believing those reasons. And in this verse, the reasons we can be free of fear and dismay all center around the fact that God is with us. That God does not leave us alone. You know, when I end a service there are basically three blessings that I use at the end of the service. I don't plan them in advance. Um, 
they're just three that I have memorized. So I, I come up here at the end of the service, and then I go through my mental Rolodex, and there are only three, so it doesn't take long. And, I, and, and then I pick one. And so I, there, there are three ways that I will end a service. One of them is uh, as you go, um, may the love of God go with you, the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. So that's one way. Another way is um, the, the ironic benediction, Aaron's benediction. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord uh, lift his countenance up upon you and be gracious to you. And, and then the third one um, is, is probably my favorite, and it goes like this. As you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go before you to guide you, above you to watch over you, behind you to protect you, beneath you to lift you up, beside you to befriend you, and most of all may go within you to give you his peace. Now the first two blessings I have memorized are scripture. They, they come from the Bible. That third one is not. The third one I got from my friend, Pastor Ed Baker in Cedar Falls from Orchard Hill Church. Um, I'll tell you how I remember it. When I come up here, I don't have it planned, and, 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 and then I have to go through that. When I was in high school, um, I was taught about something called the preposition box. Okay? I was told to picture a box, and then I was told to picture all the things you could do in a box, and, and all of the things you can do with a box are described by prepositions. So you can be in front of the box, you can be above the box, let's see if I remember, the, you can be behind the box, you can be uh, beneath the box, you can be beside the box, and you can be within the box. So when I come up here and I want to use that benediction, I just picture you all as boxes, um, and, and then I just picture all the places where Jesus can be, okay? So that, that's how I do that. That, that. That's how I remember that blessing. Now, I thought that was not a scriptural blessing until I got to this verse this week, Isaiah 41.10. I started to look at it, and I realized that most of the places on that box are covered in this verse. So listen to the verse again. God says, do not fear because I'm with you beside you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I'm above you. I will strengthen you. I'll, I'll go within you. I'll help you. I'll go behind you to protect you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I'll go beneath you to lift you up. When stress and anxiety come your way, when you feel like Joseph must have felt, when all of his hopes and dreams were dashed against Mary's unexpected pregnancy. Remember Emmanuel. God is with us. God is beside you. He's above you to watch over you. He's within you to give you strength. He's behind you to help you. And he's beneath you to uphold you with his mighty right hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, for many of us, as the calendar changes from November to December, we feel our tensions rise. The anxiety comes with this season. Um, fear. Some of us, it's, it's not even unique to the season. We wake with worry every day. And so, Lord, we need uh, to absorb your promises, the the promise that you want to carry the burden for us, that you care about us. Lord, help us to pray, to take our anxieties to you in prayer. Help us, Lord, to seek your kingdom, to, to look above ourselves at, at, at the world that you would have us engage. Help us to remember always that you are Emmanuel. You are with us. Lord, you go with us. You are over us, within us, behind us, beneath us. Lord, help us find our peace in you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So uh, we'll use the preposition box today. As you go, uh, may the Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go before you to guide you, above you to watch over you, behind you to protect you. May he go beneath you to lift you up. May he go beside you to befriend you. And most of all, may he go within you to give you his peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.